All right, we're back from break, and so we're going to continue. And just so that I make sure I've hammered this into your head about dealing with this third category of anger, anger that we have at ourselves, and that you start forgiving yourself, you know, I want to make sure that you get that, because that's going to make the difference. And when you do it right, and you get it right the first time, or the second time, or third time out, or even if it takes you ten times, but when you get that right, you will not feel the same anymore. I'm telling you, it's going to take the quality and level of your life up so high. So I really want you to go home today and really, really, you know, seriously consider all of that that has been said about the techniques for management. And I want you to remember the relationship of your conscience. You see, it's very important. Look at your, the, the contents of your conscience. And I want you to notice particularly the relationship of the violation of your conscience to the experience of guilt. You see? Yeah, I, think, I think I better not use this. Yeah, that area not coming out. But, yeah. but I want you to, to really look closely at that. Because we have guilt sometimes. We have so much guilt. Guilt is, is this feeling of being wrong, isn't it? Right? Fundamentally. You feel wrong. I'm doing something wrong. You feel guilty. But what is it that is dictating to you whether what you're doing is right or wrong? It's conscience. Your conscience. And none of that material is yours. At all. And this guilt is really a form of anger at oneself. So you want to give yourself some relief from your guilt. And we got a lot of guilt. We carry around a lot of guilt. And we need to forgive ourselves and free ourselves uh, from all these guilt trips that we are. Do that mean that we are excusing our wrong deeds, our wrongdoings? Are we uh, uh, trying to avoid being responsible for the consequences of our actions, even when those actions have caused another person agreements or our self agreements? No. What we're trying to avoid is falling into a state of self contempt. And along with this feeling good for nothing is the feeling that I am wrong. Right? Something wrong with you. And I'm here to tell you that there's nothing wrong with you. There may be something wrong with the things you're doing, yes. But you, Behind that doing, nothing wrong with you at all. So I want you to really give a lot of serious, serious thought to that. Now I asked last time that we do a little homework, and you remember that, you know, unless you do this homework, this sadhana, you, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're just going to get a lot of information, and you're going to become a hell of a conversationalist. <laughs> and people will find you endlessly fascinating to talk with. But you will not be transformed. You understand? I am an objective here is to transform. Right? So in order to transform, you have to do the sadhana. Anyone has a sadhana that they like to share? Remember I asked you to use uh, the, your next opportunity when we lit up last week to handle your anger and any of, at any of the objects that we talked about thus far, you have one. You know what? I wasn't here for okay. homework, but this, <clears throat> I don't know. All right, we'll. I had a uh, situation where um, I was on the phone. I, I was really upset about something. I was real keyed off. What did that I, mean, people? <laughs> she was what? Huh? <laughs> All right. <I> was like, <laughs> okay. And um, um, so, well, what had happened? I waited at a bus stop that the bus was no longer running. Mm -hmm. After like about an hour, I'm like, well, I know the buses are slow. <laughs> but I didn't want to pay another fare. Mm -hmm. So when I decided, well, look, this is kind of crazy. I need to like just go ahead and get another fare and go back the other way. Mm -hmm. So in doing that, I'm like a little pissed off. So when I got to the transfer point, my transfer got caught mm -hmm. and it ripped. So when I handed it to the bus driver, he looked at it. I said, is there a problem here? No, but you need to take care of this. Oh, why do you say that to me? I said, what did you say? 
So he gave me a new one. I sat down, but I was so angry with him. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I kept playing that over my head. I ought to take care of it. I'm thinking, your mouth was waggling all this to myself. Yes, yes, yes. So when I get ready to get off, I'm going to give it to him. Oh, I'm going to give it to him. And so mm. he's looking at his mirror. He can kind of see maybe smoke was coming out of me. I don't know. But as I sat there, I told myself, now, wait a minute, why are you so upset? You start me? asking a focusing question. Right. So I kind of played it, and I said, now, look, you trying to, like, you know, get yourself together, and, you know, you're not supposed to be falling into these traps, okay? So I had, like, maybe, like, a 12-watt ride. So as I'm going through this, my anger is, like, diminishing a little bit. Yes. It ain't gone yet. All right. And I said, well, uh, now, you don't know this man. Mm -hmm. Once you get off this bus, you never have to see him again. So calm yourself down. When you get ready to get off the bus, you don't have to say anything to him. Well, anyway, I get near my stop, and I got up, and I tell him, I said, you know, I was going to be angry with you. Uh -huh. But I decided that maybe you had a day like I had, and I'm going to forgive you. And he looked at me, because I know that brother knew I was ready. To yes, 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 yes. And we both had a good laugh. Yeah. And, you know, when I got off the bus, I felt so good because, see, I could have gotten off and said what I had to say, <laughs> pissed him off, and maybe he would have caught me in the bus. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, That's right. Yeah, I, I really felt pretty good. You felt good. Yeah. Uh, you did a yeah. homework. Uh, yeah. uh, was it perfect? No, it wasn't perfect. Was it a complete fiasco? No. No. It was good or what? Good uh, enough. Was good it. enough, yeah. It was good enough. And... Did you have a sense of relief? Oh, you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. From that pressure, yeah. of that anger energy. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. You had a relief of pressure, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Right? No relief. You gave yourself some emotional relief, didn't you? Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. Didn't you? Mm -hmm. Right? And did you handle it in a way that uh, was mature? Pretty good. Right? So you had a sense of maturity. Were you successful? What did the success? Yeah. He smiled. He smiled. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So you, you have given yourself a success. You made that happen. Right? And if that situation happened again, could you do it again? Oh, yeah. What we call it when you can have the feeling that you can do something. What is that feeling called? Hmm? Confidence. No confidence. Confidence. That's right. So we have to put names on these feelings so that oh, you okay. get used to them. You felt confident, in it, right? Did you accomplish something that day? Yes. Yeah, you had a sense of, of that you really accomplished something. And what about peace of mind? Did you get a little peace of mind? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of restored your peace of mind? Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course you did. You gave yourself some peace of mind because your mind was sitting there up in shambles. According to your testimony, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just, just running, mm -hmm. painful thoughts running through your head, mm -hmm. right? And you were able to manage that anger in such a way that you came out of that by coming back into a better state of mind. You gave yourself some peace of mind. That could have ruined your whole day, yeah. right? Could have ruined your whole day. Impossibly did. Uh, do did you have a sense of? Uh, were you compelled to do that? Um, did you, did, I mean, uh, or, or was some other outside force working on you to make you do that? No, I guess it was all within. You, so you, you chose. You had a choice then. Mm -hmm. You could have sat there and stewed and stinged, right? Mm -hmm. Or you could have went and addressed them, right? And you chose. You had a sense of choice there. Okay, good. Were you playing a role? Were you acting? Hmm? No. Were you playing the role of a typical black sister on a hot summer day and <laughs> had your head and eyes? Did you have all that stuff going? Huh? Were you in a role? Were you playing a role? No. 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 Not at all. Uh, so that means that you must have had an identity independent of a role. You had some identity. Did you, uh, would you be afraid to do that again? Oh, no. 
wouldn't have no, wouldn't hesitate with you. What do they call it when you're able to do something without any fear? What is that called? When you're not afraid. Courage. Courage. You gave yourself, you did something that built your courage. It took courage. You gave yourself a, you, a, a, an experience of courage. Did you feel that you couldn't do it? That it was just no way in the world I can go up here and, and, and come say these things to this man. You didn't feel that at all? No. You had a sense that you had the power to, to do this thing. Right. You had a sense of power. Mm -hmm. Did you feel out of control of the situation or did you feel totally in control of how you were going to handle that? Yeah. You felt in control, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, by that point. By that point, of course. Of course, we're talking that this, yeah. these are the end products, yeah. right? <laughs> but you had a sense of control. What about uh, uh, a sense of being liberated from an old pattern oh, of behavior? Yeah. Did you have that? Mm -hmm. That suddenly you were able for the once in your life to act outside of all that conditioning and all that instinct. That you were liberated yeah. from a certain pattern of behavior mm -hmm. that you have been following. Probably all your life, family situations like that. Right? Mm -hmm. A kind of liberation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's many, many more, but these are the feelings of self respect. That's what self respect feels like. And you have to get used to feeling like that. Did it feel good? Did you feel good getting off that bus? Mm -hmm. You were proud of yourself, right? Of course. It's a legitimate basis for pride. Was it arrogance? No, not at all. But you were proud of the way you act. You handled that right. What about your judgment? Did, was it perfect, absolutely flawless? No. Was it totally wrong? No. It was good of what? No. No. Absolutely. You had good judgment. And now, uh, can you, uh, did, it, did it give you more confidence in yourself? Well, yeah, I told yeah. that I was more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when we have this feeling of confidence in ourselves, that we can go with our own judgment, what do we have? We now have what kind of relationship with ourselves? Particularly as it relates to your judgment. Do you doubt your judgment? You did what to your judgment in this case? You did what? What's the word? Exercise. Yeah, you exercised it. But you trust it. Did you consult anybody on the bus? Did y'all go out <laughs> Now look, this man done pissed me off 12 blocks ago, and I'm going to tell this son of a bitch a thing or two. What do you think? Of, should I tell him? Did, did you consult? Huh? You figured it all out by yourself? How to act right? You trust in your own judgment. Have trust. You trust your own judgment to handle a situation that could have otherwise been difficult. You didn't keep it all balled up at home in yourself and then run home and call your girlfriend and say, Girl, let me tell you what happened, right? This man did so and so, so and so, so and so. I should have did this. You didn't go through all that I shouldn't, right? You trust your judgment and you acted on it, right? So all of these again becomes the feelings that accompany any kind of subject. Whenever you do any kind of spiritual work on yourself, you're going to start getting these feelings, and it feels good. Right? Let's go a little deeper into that homework. Originally, what triggered her anger? What was the triggering thing? The, 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 the transportation. The transportation, right? So someone wasn't going her way with her, right? So you, you, so that triggered her, I think. The, the bus systems are not running the way they're supposed to be running. Makes me angry, yeah. right? Car in the shop. Car in the shop. <laughs> right. That's it. So that triggered her thing, right? That sent her off. Nothing wrong with it. She. The point is managing the business. Mm -hmm. Who was she angry at in the episode? We know she was angry at the bus driver, right? Yeah. Who else? Probably the car dealer herself. The car dealer, the car dealer, probably. Right? You right. made it right. herself for a week. You were angry at the weather. Probably. Yeah. Right. yeah. Abstract yeah. anger. That's abstract anger. Yeah. Yeah. She, she had everybody. Like huh? And was she also angry at who else? Yeah. And what way? 
She should have known the bus wasn't running during those hours. Right, and how did that make her feel about herself? Mm -hmm. okay. Not knowledgeable. Not knowledgeable. What is About the, the colloquial? System. What is the colloquial <laughs> term that we use? Dumb. Made her feel stupid. <laughs> she was standing there feeling stupid about herself, right? And the longer she stood there, the more stupid she felt, and the more anger built up. The only thing that could rescue her from her stupidity was the bus coming, and it wouldn't come, right? And then she tore a transfer to add to the feeling, right? <laughs> right? Right? So she, she, she and, and so she was angry at herself. And your parting words to that uh, bus driver was? No, maybe you had a day like I did. Right. And so, actually, you were forgiving yourself. Yeah. yeah. You, you forgave yourself, right? For all of that stuff. Now that, that's good, because that's the kind of stuff we want to do. Now she could have handled it a different way altogether, of course. You could have resorted to something what we call mischief, right? Yeah. Mischief, we define that as doing that which does not need to be done. It don't need to be done. Reality does, did not call for it. It's inappropriate. Right? So you could have got into your mischief, couldn't you? Right? But you disengaged from your own mischief. Right? Because you were sitting there and your mind was full of some mischief. Mm -hmm. You were plotting ways to do something that didn't even need to be done. You didn't need to go up there and cut something out. You were trying to figure out now how, what, what, what I'm going to do here. But everything that was coming to your mind fell in the category of mischief. Right? Something that did not even need to be done. Right? And so you had to disengage yourself from your own mischief, right? And was the bus driver being a little mischief too? Did he do a little mischief on you? That, and that really just, and, and remember, there's positive and negative behavior, right? And mischief is negative behavior. If he had responded positively, you wouldn't have had no problem, right? But he did. So he gave you some negative behavior that you had to manage, right? Because that made you angry. Don't mischief make us angry? Whenever people do something that really don't need to be done, that makes us angry. Of course. Now, what do you think uh, are the prospect of people stopping mischief? No. <laughs> Very low. Yeah, because it gives you a sense of relief, I have to admit. It's a sense of relief from doing it. I mean, it doesn't yeah. need to be done, but when I do it, I feel like. Eh. Yeah. 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 You feel a momentary rush and sense of relief because you've gotten some revenge, right? You've gotten some revenge. Usually following your act of revenge, sooner or later, you start feeling some guilt about I did something that was stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? I shouldn't even have done that brother like this or said this to that sister. You know what I mean? You, however uh, quiet that realization is, it's there, it comes with the territory. You know almost instantly that you acted out of order, that you are out of my heart. You see? Well, does anybody else know that you're out of my heart? It's, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You know you're out of my heart. You see? And that registers somewhere in the deep recesses of your own psychology. Your psychology. So, in any case, that the, the bus driver was up to some mischief, too. He said something that really didn't need to be said at all, right? And that just compounded the situation. So you got to handle your anger at yourself, you got to handle your abstract anger at the weather, the car dealer, the car, the guy that sold you the car, <laughs> you know. I mean, you got all these issues floating around, right? And then he had some more with his mischief, his nonsense, you see? And that was the straw that broke that camel's back, right? And so you had a place, somebody to hang that blame on. Now this bus driver became the blame of all that it went wrong that day. <laughs> and you, you're trying to get some relief, right? By yes. dealing with that problem, you see. And all of that you were able to catch and manage. It could have gotten real ugly. It could have gotten real ugly. So that's good. Anybody else have a homework or something other thing that they would like to share? I had one. It, was, it didn't tell the whole lot of things. Uh, okay. The argument at work. All right. You want to Tell us about it, for the record. 
It was uh, last Saturday, right after the anger management class. Mm -hmm. I had an argument uh, with the guy that I was assigned to work with. Uh, my partner went to the Barry White concert, so I had to end up working with this Mexican. Mm. And we got some underlying anger towards each other. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we were friends, and we still are friends. We, saw, we studied for the sergeant's exam together. Mm -hmm. We both gonna be promoted together. But what I don't like about him is that he thinks all black people are stupid. Mm -hmm. And he's stupid himself. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, he's just a dumb Mexican. Mm -hmm. And his thing is, he don't like the way I dress on the streets. Okay. See, because his thing is, he wants to arrest everybody black. Mm -hmm. They say a black person is doing something, he just run up there. Mm -hmm. And I know last time we worked together last year, we were going to uh, storm a building. And when we went in the building, one guy ran, just one guy out of a whole crowd. Him and his partner chased the guy. I stood there and start, I knew everybody in the crowd mm -hmm. and they got mad at me for that. Like, why didn't you help us chase this one guy? I said, why didn't you all stay here? Only one guy ran, 20 stayed. Mm -hmm. Why would you chase one guy? We ended up having nothing. So uh, when I came in, I was reading his nonverbal uh, body language. He was laying on the bench. He didn't want to go out. He took his shoes off. So when we went out on the streets, he was saying, you want to meet back up tonight at 1 o'clock? I said, no, I'm staying to work. So uh, we were going to hit this building. So when we hit the building, they told him somebody was selling drugs. So he just got real excited. But he almost fell in some mud running in the building. Mm -hmm. And so this lady said, damn, you about to fall. And he got his shoes all muddy. And then she said, brother, you, walk, you ran right through that mud and didn't even get your shoes dirty. So it was a guy coming out on my side and a guy coming out on his side. I stopped and searched the guy on my side. And he stopped, he let the guy go by on his side. So I noticed like 30 seconds went by, I couldn't find him. Mm -hmm. And I searched the whole building, I couldn't find him. So when I came back downstairs, we had two other guys there assisting us. And they say he does this all the time, which he did. Last year he was wrestling with three guys with a newsie mm -hmm. and almost got killed. And every, every night is like, this is what he does. He just sneaks off and nobody can find him. Mm -hmm. So I was hip to him already. So he came out, there's a crowd of people. And he gonna try to check me in front of the crowd. Like, right. you abandoned me. I said, I didn't abandon you. But I knew he was gonna respond like that. Yeah, he started screaming, he started yelling. Then he, he comes up on me and started screaming and yelling. I started screaming and yelling at him. So he kind of bagged off for that. But he said one thing that I noticed these guys, they try to use that mind game on. He said, take me in to see the watch command. I said, no problem. So I didn't say anything to him. I took him in there to see the watch command. But I know that's the strategy that white boys like to use because they always try to put you in that trick bag like, hey, let's work this out. I said, I'm not going to even give them that pleasure. And uh, I stood up to him. And uh, as a matter of fact, last night, that same lady, I didn't even know who she was. She came up. She said, you know what? I'm glad you done what you done. She said, because he think all black people are, are stupid. Mm -hmm. And everybody over there like, admired what I'd done because mm -hmm. I knew that this was a racial thing mm -hmm. with him, mm -hmm. okay, because he plays superior because, you know, they get these guys in the car, you know, and it's just like, you talking about Step and Fletching. I mean, it's just like, these people are like in the 1800s mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they come in contact with the police. And uh, the next night, the sergeant cursed him out. Mm -hmm. And, and call them all type of spicks mm -hmm. and dumb. And guess who he worked with? He came and got me mm -hmm. and talked to me all night long and telling me how we got the United Brothers and mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I got pissed at him because I know he think he's superior to black people, and and I've always had that problem with him. And uh, I didn't get upset or anything like that when we were going through this. I was just trying to understand the guy more or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I handled it real well, but mainly I done it to stand up for the race. And how did because he tried to front me off in front of all these yes. other black people, like, okay. he's so good. All right. And after that uh, conflict, how did you feel? I felt relieved. You felt relieved? Yeah. All right. Now, you all heard the story. Now, in the story, what are the issues? The issue was... The issue I was, them, he was saying... I want them to... All right, but he said that I didn't bag him up, but what I felt... What made him help? angry? What made me angry? Who angry? Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Let me say what made angry? me angry. All right. I didn't what, tell what, made you what made me angry was he accused me of not running behind wherever he went. Right. My thing is something could have happened to me right here. Mm -hmm. 
30 seconds of searching this guy, I realized you weren't anywhere around. I started looking for you. Mm -hmm. You stayed away from me 10 or 15 minutes. Did you ever think about my safety? Mm -hmm. You come out pissed off at me saying that I didn't follow you. What about me? Mm -hmm. How about if this guy would have pulled a gun out and shot me? Mm -hmm. Or hit me or done something to harm me? Mm -hmm. You accusing me of not bagging you up. Where was my bag up at? We mm -hmm. supposed to stay together. You mm -hmm. ran off, not me. Mm -hmm. You so, know, you should have came back and saw if I was all right. Okay, so that was the thing that made That was angry. the issue. Because yeah. I want to see what triggered his anger. That's what yeah. triggered my anger. The guy abandoning me, running off. That's what triggered his anger, but my anger back to him was the same thing. You abandoned me. The yeah. same thing you accusing right. me of, right. I'm accusing you right. of. And that set off the anger episode. Right. And as you mentioned, there was already an undercurrent there. It's already so an undercurrent. the first time. All right, what other questions would you all ask him? I want you to get used to, you know, because that's the whole purpose, you see. You, you objective in this situation, so you can learn something. What, if you were uh, uh, looking at this thing, you know, I want you to analyze it. Who was he angry at? We know he was angry at this guy. Was there anybody else he was angry at? What kind of anger did he have? What were the objects of his anger? Racism. Racism, right? Good. And that called into the category of what we call abstract, right? What, what was, were there any other objects of his anger? Well, somewhat betrayal. Well, the first one, obviously, is the Mexican. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, the other person. Yeah. But, but let's find, were well, there any other objects of his anger? I think he may have been a little angry himself, too. In what way? Um, I don't know, really, but... Um, I, I guess all black people feel this. Whenever racism is directed toward them, they wonder, what is it that I've done mm -hmm. to, to trigger this? Is it something that I'm doing that's, that's uh, off key? And if it is, why, I mean, what am I doing? Why is it always happening to me? As he says, this guy has done it on a number of occasions. So um, I'm thinking that perhaps maybe you've internalized it a little bit. You feel that, that maybe you've done something that that may have warranted his his, his acting in the way that he's acted? I just know that sometimes they forget it's a thin line. When they're used to dealing with just blacks, sometimes they treat the police officers the same way because, in other words, they're just used to dealing with niggas. Sometimes right. they forget we the police too. Mm -hmm. I got the same, and, and I that's what my objective was, to remind him. He came up on me. And I got him back up off of me. When you gonna do arrest me? Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. you can use that with citizens. Mm -hmm. If I said something to you you don't like it, I lock you up for this early He mm -hmm. couldn't do that with me. So he was guilty of some big time mischief, was he? Big time mischief, big time and he mischief. only dates white women. He lives in an all white community. It's like he even hates being a Mexican. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he wants to be white until the white sergeant showed him the next night. You ain't white. Mm -hmm. Call him a pepper belly, wet back. Mm -hmm. And that's when he wants to be friends with me now. Right. Now we are brothers. Right. But the night before, in front of all these other black people out here, you're going to put me down. You're going to try to check me. That was betrayal in that because you all had studied before for your sergeant. We studied together. For him to go up against you knowing a little something about you, that's betrayal. But see, his thing is he likes to show off in front of people. See, I knew that. Are we trying to Even focus so, on what, more what triggered you? What triggered me is that yes, he came right. out screaming and yelling that, man, you abandoned me. I was in there by myself. Worthless. And I said, I was there by myself. Yes, yes, yes. But I wasn't really th that angry. I was angry, but I wasn't screaming. You was screaming. on the controller. I said, well, wait a minute, man. Yeah. You talking about you somewhere. What about me right here? You know, just like you were there and you felt I wasn't there, I said, I feel the same way. <clears throat> and then that's when he started coming up on me, talking loud and screaming and yelling. And that's when I stepped down where he was at. Now, let me ask you, how would you have handled that if you didn't know what you know now? No, I would just ask him uh, what he wanted to do about it. Mm -hmm. Would you have handled it as well? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> how did you feel after handling it? I felt good. You felt good. In what ways? I felt good because I didn't let him try to intimidate me, and two, the same people he tried to embarrass me in front of, I actually think that I made some people feel proud because they're talking about it now. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of, because they can't do it. Mm -hmm. If they'd done what I'd done, he would have probably planted some drugs on them or a gun or locked mm -hmm. them up. They actually, I felt good because 
they were, I was acting through them, or they were acting through me. In other words, they mm -hmm. they were you glad almost to see had that. the feeling of a hero. Dude. Sort of like a hero because, yeah. like the girl told me last Before. night, we want to do that to you him. But we're afraid that he's going to put a gun on us or some mm -hmm. drugs or something mm -hmm. on us. Yeah. Or at least a disorderly conduct. Right. And so when I stood, and I wasn't even conscious of it, I was mainly getting them off me at first. And then as it went on, I was seeing what his intentions were. And I stood up for the race in you, my mind. You disengaged from his mischief, and you handled that man. Right. Right? You didn't react to his mischief. No. Nope. Right? And when he calmed down, I calmed down. See, one of the things that we do, remember the first thing, is that the first mistakes that we do whenever we encounter mischief, when somebody is doing something that don't need to be done, the first mistake we make, of course, is taking it personal. Did you take any of that personal? Did you see it as any reflection on your work? No, I, I kind of understood where he was coming from. You understood where you're coming from. The second mistake that we normally do is to try to uh, understand nonsense. It's nonsense. Don't try to understand it. It's nonsense. You see, you recognize that all of this uh, posturing and, uh, and uh, behavior on behalf of this other officer was nonsense. So you didn't try to make sense out of nonsense, right? You just dealt with it on your own terms, didn't you? Right? You're not to go off of your terms for nonsense. And you stood there and you gave yourself an experience of self respect. You acted in a way, were you proud of the way you acted? I was proud of it. Was it mature? It was mature. Was it professional? Real professional. You, and uh, uh, could you do that again? Yeah. We call that what? Right. Were you afraid to, to bust that mischief? No. Nope. Call that what? Courage. Right? Look at all that stuff. Look at one little experience. Again, good example of what you get when you do it. Uh, did, were you afraid to come to work the next day? Well, speak it to him the next day. Speak it to him the next day. It almost like improved the relationship. Yeah, I just, hey, man, was, hey, good night. I didn't. I didn't have any animosity towards you. Him you, you had none of that stuff walking just around. Let, you know, just don't bring me that. You know, and you, we still cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had lunch. I took him to lunch the next day. Isn't that nice? Right after the sergeant <laughs> got on him, you know, he came and rolled with me. Nice? And my partner, I took him to lunch. No thirst for revenge. Very nice. Anybody else have a homework? As we running out of time, I want to get as much homework up on the board as possible. Anybody else that did a homework? Remember, it could have been a homework that involved you using some of your skills, practicing some of this theory, or it could have been the part of the homework that I wanted you to examine your good intentions for others, your own mischief. Did anybody examine their own mischief? And, of course, the mischief of, of others, others' good intentions towards you. Did you examine that? Because, I, you know, I want you to do these, these kind of things. Because that's the only way to get this. There is a level of understanding that can only occur within the context of sodomy. You cannot get it from books. You cannot get it from lectures. You cannot get it any other way than from actually doing the thing itself. So if you're really desirous of having maximum uh, uh, insight and get maximum benefits from this here, you have to do some sodomy. So, uh, you don't have to do it perfect either, because you ain't perfect, so we don't expect perfection. Did anybody examine any of their good intentions that they have for other people? Then let's, 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 let's look at some of the good intentions that we have for other people in a general way. What are some of the obvious good intentions? Who is, for instance, who is the most likely uh, objects of our good intentions? Kids, your children. one your children, right? Who else? Spouses, of course. Parents. Parents. Co-workers. Co Some other uh, people whom we find ourselves in relationship with. Friends. Friends, of course. 
couple years of experience, all kinds of good advice, <laughs> right? Good advice is a form of a good intention. Please make a note of that. The giving of advice is a form of good intention. And let me add one other thing. What makes it so enjoyable when you give other people advice, trust me, I know about this, <laughs> huh? And that it gives you an artificial sense of superiority over the person receiving the advice. It's immensely enjoyable. And you have to be very careful of that, right? And you have to interact with your friends and all these other people that we're putting up here on the board with real intentions, right? And what is the distinction between good intentions and real intentions? The difference is that, remember, good intentions are a form of mischief. It's that which don't even need to be done. Fundamentally. When you interact with your friends within the context of the reality of the situation, right? That's a real intention. It's a real intention. Friend comes to you, they're, they're, they're broke, they have no money, you give them some good advice. Well, listen, won't you get you a job and go down here and do that? But that don't, that needs, that's not what needs to be done. The friend is broke, they need some money, give them some money. It's a real intention. Because it deals directly with the reality of that person's situation and circumstance. That's what needs to be done. Uh, as opposed to a lecture. The lecture is, is a good intention. Right? And the good intention, as we said before, disguise our ambition. And my ambition and goal is to not have my money go from this pocket to that guy's pocket, right? And to achieve that, let me create a great lecture, right? A great lecture. So give him some good advice, but I'm not going to give him no money. Because I want to keep my money. You see? The point is that we all have good intentions, almost for everybody that comes with us. As you work on this, we, do we have good intention for society? Of course. You have good intention for other black people? Of course. You know? So you have a good intention for your ethnic group? Right? You have all kinds of good intentions. Right? And good intentions are a form of mischief. It is that which does not now, as you look over your life and you look within the context of your relationship with your children, how much of that interaction that you're having with your children don't need to be done? How many of the things you are saying to them don't need to even be said? That is pure mystery. Hmm? And you have to look at this. Because the, our whole ideal is that, and we can look at it because even if we find ourselves guilty across the whole spectrum, do that make us worthless human beings? No. Of course not. Absolutely not. Yes? Can I ask a question? I don't know if this would be a good intention. Okay. But uh, this morning, my son told me he wanted to go. Yesterday, he said, I'm going to go look for a job at McDonald's. Okay. So I know I can go. And I saw a friend of mine. He said, be there about 9. So I go in his room at 9.15. He's playing Sega Genesis. And him and his friend, because they both want to go look for jobs, is turn it off and get out of the house. I says, if you're serious about getting a job, then do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I says, if you don't want a job, don't tell me you're looking for a job, and then I would expect to see playing Sega. He like little, you know, mm -hmm. they, you know, but they laugh, and I, you know, mm -hmm. I can't hear. Was that a good intention, or was, was it your a ideal for him to go to McDonald's? Oh no, no, no. He had decided that that was what he wanted to do, but it angered me that he. You know, had made this decision, and I go in there, and they playing the game. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing to first. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. That part of it is interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, why did you get angry? What anger? Well, did I you wasn't like angry, like you know, but mm -hmm. I, I just thought that if you say you're going to do something, you want to teach them. First something. things come first. If you're serious about a job, then you don't wait until twelve o'clock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't wait that you finish your. Was it something that needs to, to have been said to him? I mean, use your own judgment. Well, yeah, I thought, right. of the, I thought, yeah, that he should have been out the door going about the business he said he was going to um, attend to. Mm -hmm. And play safe when he get back home. Okay. 
But so, we had a good intention. Well, you see, you have to answer that question. You see, because you only you know your subjective ambitions and goals as it relates to that particular incident. All right? It is almost as if if, a, if I saw a person that got hit by a car and I run over and I, uh, I, I try to make them comfortable and reduce their pain to an ambulance come. Is that a good intention? No. Or is that a real intention? No. It's a real intention. Right? But if I'm standing on the corner and I'm running around screaming and I'm said that I'm going to go downtown to City Hall and I'm going to protest because there should be more ambulance just cruising the neighborhood looking for these random events, damn it, and they treat black people like dirt, right? That's not real. That, that has nothing to do with the reality of the situation, right? That's not what was needed at that time. I needed to run over there and help that person, not run the city hall while the person in their leave. you see? So again, you can tell whether or not you are perpetrating a good intention by looking at what does the reality of the situation called for and to do that, you see? And that's how you know. But we can begin to examine that. This is a big one. Almost all of the conflicts in, in, in these kind of um, spousal relationships is rooted in good intentions. You know, we all bring certain uh, good intentions into these relationships, you see? And it causes the other person hell. Right? Causes them hell. We have good intention for all of the people that we've listed here. How do we deal with our good intentions mind that we have for other people? Mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> but does it mean that you withdraw and you cease to be a uh, contributed anything? Because remember, I said there's two sides of life. There's the side where you are making a contribution to others. Then there's the side where you are just useless. Is the solution to good intentions, the solution to good intentions simply becoming useless to other people by minding your own business? Is that a form of uselessness? What's negative? Hmm? I think that's negative, being useless. It's right, it's negative. It's meaningless. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so it's wrong, speak, right? So how do we make authentic contribution to other people's lives without subjecting them to our good intentions? It's a question that we all have to answer. If we are parents, right? Uh, if we have friends, if we have lovers, we have to know this. We really have to know this. So I don't want this to be just an academic exercise, right? I mean, you really have to know the answer to these kind of questions. These are some of the... Uh, the, the primal questions that we have to find answers to as we go through this journey called life, particularly when we're at this adult level of it. We have to be able to know these kind of things. Particularly concerns our children, our spouse, and others, we have to just talk to them, communicate with them, and find out what their desires are so that we are uh, inadvertently co opting mm -hmm. their dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, we can want certain things for our kids or even for our spouses. If that's not what they want, then we're not, we're not helping Absolutely. The first thing, to, in order to get into a, a, a posture where you even can contribute, you must know what the, the, uh, what the other person's goals are. Their goals, aims, and ambitions. How are you going to make a contribution to a person? You don't even know what their goals, aims, and ambitions are. I ask people all the time, they come in, uh, you can and you can put the question to yourself. What were the original goals and ambition of your husband or your wife? And most married people cannot answer that question. They really can't. They have no idea because they've been on the useless side of the relationship, the egotistical side of the relationship. What you can do for me? They've been into a, a posture of me. They don't know what the other person's goals, ambitions and aims of life on their talk. They don't have a clue. Therefore, how can you make a contribution to, to, to your mate? So you're absolutely right. We have to have good communication. It doesn't mean, do you have to talk 12 hours a day? Absolutely not. It's not how long you talk. It's the quality of information that is transferred in the conversation. But we have to know the other person's goal and ambition that we are having. 
relationship with. And then we have to make a contribution directly related to the reality of their goals, ambitions, and aims. Does that, does that make sense to you? You know, Bob, uh, with the ethnic group, and, and, and that, that one gets so tricky because black leadership, uh, on one hand, you could probably say people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and Farrakhan, they in a very well-meaning way they have want good, good yeah, for black people. Yes, they do. But you can wonder sometimes because of their methods, just how authentic those Politicians are, are the yeah. traditional bastillion of good intentions. Hence, almost everything they touch, they mess up. You see? Almost everything they do turns out wrong, turns out counterproductive to the welfare of their constituents. Very rare would you get a politician that is not uh, suffering from, uh, you know, uh, overwhelming good intentions. You see, they don't have real intentions for the country, for, for their, their constituents. So you're absolutely right, and uh, 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 and that's what I meant when I said that all of us have, to some extent, good intentions for the rest of the race. But why do I want you to stand up to the white man? so that I could benefit. You understand? I, I myself am not going to stand up because it's too dangerous. You go protest Martin Luther King so that I can ride the bus. You see? I'm not going to do that. Right? So we disguise again, even at the level of race and the political reality that confronts us as black people. We disguise, you see, our own ambitions, goals, and desires in the form of good intention for other black people. Or black people really need to start uh, shopping with other black businesses. It's called, I want to open up a black business and be the recipient of this, 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 this kind of trade. Right? So who do you find really preaching that part the most? Businessmen. Black people need to spend more money with black people. They might be speaking a reality, no doubt about it, but look at the motive behind it. You see? They stand to be enriched. So these good intentions always fail. Hence, we're, look where we're at. We're in the same situation. Virtually, at a standstill, politically, economically, socially, across all of the various dimensions of society. There's very little. They evidence. always fail. Always fail. With the good intentions, because they're never really for the other person. Remember, good intentions looks like they're on this side of life, the, contribu the contributing side of life. Good intentions are always on the useless side of life. You see, with no exception, because they're not even related to the reality of the needs of the individual at all. Period. Why do I want I want my daughter to become a doctor and, and, and make five hundred thousand dollars a year? Is that does it have I paused for one minute to, to consider her goals and ambition? I impose that on them. Right? For their own welfare. But I get bright look at the bragging rights I get. You know, my daughter is a They've got a doctor, and she make fun of the doctor. Your, what's your daughter do? You see, I got some bragging rights. You understand? I got some bragging rights. So it's, it comes down to that. You see? So it's, 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 it's always, good intentions are always on the wrong side of the equation of life, of a meaningful life. Remember, I define a meaningful life. Life is meaningful only to the extent that you contribute. Uh, Marad used to talk about Sefa. Same. Service. You can tell the degree of a person's spiritual attainment by the degree of savor that they render to mankind. You find no savor, you find a person that has no spiritual attainment whatsoever. Period. And in this savor, you will find there's four levels that you could contribute it. The lowest, of course, is material. It is the law, lowest form of contribution that you can make to another human being at the material level. Okay? Because it only impacts on the individual on the peripheral of their being. Hmm? 
So you can give another individual some food, clothing, and shelter. And that's good. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. But you are not contributing uh, at the highest levels yet. So when we say, well, I want to give my child some food, some clothing, and some shelter, and that's the whole end of your parental aim. That means that you're only dealing with your own child in the most superficial level of their being. Nothing wrong with that. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't provide your children with food, clothing, and shelter, but if that's all you're going to contribute to them, then you're giving them very little with respect to what you could have given them. Your contribution has been of the lowest form. That the material. The next level is at the level of uh, what well, this I have to put wealth in. Materiality and wealth, the lowest levels of contribution that you can make. The next level that you can make a contribution at is at the emotional level. At the emotional level. Give them some feeling about themselves. Give people a good feeling about themselves. Why are you always giving people bad feelings about themselves? You're always critiquing. You're always finding something wrong. Why are you giving them that down trip? If you're going to give them something, let, give them a good feeling about themselves. Particularly when you know that their whole environment might be creating the counter experience of self-contempt. You don't need to be adding to the experience of self-contempt. For what are you adding to people's experience of self-contempt for? How are you helping anybody? By reinforcing their feelings of self-contempt. Reinforcing their feelings of inadequacies. You see, reinforcing their feeling of wrongness. You know, uh, you did this wrong, Linda. You did that wrong. You got that wrong. You didn't do this right. You didn't do that perfect. How the hell is that helping you? That's not giving you anything. It's, in fact, it's taken from you. It's a but if we can give somebody just a kind word, some praise, then you're contributing something that that person need and appreciate because you may be giving them the first praise and kind word they ever received in their life. Hmm? They've been starving for this kind of affection, you see, and love all their life. No one has validated them. No one has told them that they have value in spite of their imperfections, shortcomings, and faults. No one has acted like they, I'm not saying just tell them, act like they have value. You understand the distinction? I don't want you to get clever, because I know you people are clever. You'll get the rhetoric right. I'm not interested in the rhetoric. I want you to act like they have value and worth. Put that in your actions, the way you interact with them. Hmm? You have not helped anybody. If you say, well, I can tell you that you got a headache, how does that help that headache? You understand? You have to have a real intention for that person. So that's the next level of contribution that you can make to another human being and to mankind in general. The third level, of course, is at the mental or intellectual level. Knowledge. Share knowledge. When you contribute a knowledge to people, you have given a great thing to the person. The gift and sharing of knowledge is way superior to just the giving of materiality as well. If you're in relationship to your children and if you haven't given them any emotional stuff, if you haven't given them any knowledge, what kind of parent are you? Yes, you can say, well, I paid for their tuition in school and I bought them gym shoes for 21 years. I did my job. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You did nothing in comparison to what you could have done as a parent. And in the obligatory role of a parent, because you are parenting to the degree that you are moving beyond giving your children just the material. That's how you measure parenting. 
That's how you know whether you got it right. If you haven't gone beyond the level of, uh, let me give them some clothes and some shoes and a place to lay their head and some bus fare to go to school. If you haven't gone beyond that level in your parenting, you don't have a clue as to how to do this thing called parenting. This thing is a great art. Hmm? So you have to be able to move. So when you're able to give knowledge, that's even higher. You make it even more of a that means your life is becoming even more meaningful. And you can remember to the extent that you are able to make these contributions to the same extent you appreciate it. People that you are able to make a contribution to on the emotional level will always appreciate you more than people that you are simply able to make a contribution to on the material level, with no exception. And people to whom you can share knowledge and give knowledge will even appreciate you more. And of course, the highest one is the spiritual. The spiritual contribution, which is just love. Just love. If you can just love people, just flat out relate to them as God relates to them. Accept them. Appreciate them. Celebrate them. Love them. See them as being the same as you are. That is the highest contribution you can make. And the way this thing works is that you can almost see how the level that you contribute to a person on affects you. How do you know when you're contributing in another person's life at this lowest possible level of wealth? You will feel it because it will impoverish you. I got $100, I give you 50, right? I experience some impoverishment, don't I? My money's cut in half, right? So even as I help them, I, there's an element of resentment, right? An undercurrent, because it's costing, right? If I'm giving them this compliment, this feeling, notice now, I don't lose anything. Don't gain anything, but I don't lose anything. Either. And these two categories, when you give your knowledge and, and you give this praise and respect to people, you don't lose anything. You don't gain anything, or do you? Yes, you do, don't you? Right? Because when you give them that kind of respect, you get their respect, don't you? See, it's a giving what you gain. Right? I respect you, you will respect me. Look what I gained. I didn't lose anything. I gained in that process. And that transaction, it was a profit, wasn't it? And I give knowledge. Do I lose any of my knowledge when I give you my knowledge? None. I don't lose one iota of it. Right? No loss in that transaction. You see, in fact, if I can trigger and uh, stimulate your capacity to uh, to acquire knowledge, I will be the beneficiary of that. You will eventually bring some knowledge back to me that I didn't have. Look at that; it's beautiful. And of course, this is the supreme thing. When you love, you give back the love from another person. There is absolutely no loss. So our ideal is to enter into deeper and deeper levels of contribution within the lives of the people that we've listed here. Try to contribute at deeper and deeper levels in your relationship with your children, with your spouse. Try it. Don't intellectualize it. Don't treat it like it's a math problem. Try this stuff. See with your own eyes. Hear with your own ears. Feel with your own heart what I'm trying to explain to you in these words. But the words don't do justice. These words can't capture this feeling. No more than words can capture a sunrise. How will words capture a sunrise? Now that's not possible. I don't care how skillful you are at poetry. You cannot capture the beauty of a sunrise in words. Similarly, I cannot paint a picture for you adequately to describe what it feels like when you are contributing. You feel meaningful. You know how meaningless you feel now? How you feel life is your life is meaningless because it is meaningless. Understand this. You are feeling that your life is meaningless because it is meaningless. You are not contributing. Sometimes you're not even contributing at this level. Some of us are in a relationship of no contribution. It's ugly. Ugly. But the deeper you contribute automatically, the more meaningful. Meaningless, you, know, you feel it. Because you have become more meaningful. You see? When a Jesus 
who made his life meaningful. There's no more. Time itself is split. You understand? But Guru Rajneesh beautifully says in one of his books that this advent of a phenomenon like Jesus Christ is so immense that when he is no more, the creation is different. The flowers do not bloom the same way after Jesus as they did when he was here. Because that energy that was Jesus was permeating the universe. It is said about Tathagata, Gautama, the Buddha, that his compassion, his compassion, which is in his contribution side, his compassion, his ability to give to people was so immense. They said that there's never been a mystic who have arrived on this planet who was more compassionate than Lord Buddha. His compassion was such that it radiated a field that spread 24 miles in all directions. And anything that that Buddha field fall into was spring into full life. If the Buddha field moves and it crosses a dead plant, that plant will instantly blossom into life. Such is the power of making a contribution at that level. A Buddha can take that person that is depressed and just bring that depression out. Because they contribute something to them. You understand? So our lives then have meaning to the extent that we are contributing. But look how we approach in life. On the useless side. On the mini side, on the egotistical side. And so when you die, the universe will say, good riddance, bastard. <laughs> you know, you've done nothing no way. It was a waste of life on you. What did you do with your life? There's an interesting story they say that when uh, uh, all these holy men and saints, moralists, good church going folks, when they get to heaven, 99.9% .9 of them will be rejected and not allowed to enter through the gates. St. Peter will not be interested in how many times you went to church and how punctual you was. He is not interested in what choirs and committees you were on. St. Peter is only interested in, did you feed somebody? Did you do that? Whom did you clothe? Whom did you visit who was sick? What did you do? He want to know what contribution did you make with your life? And most of us will be able to say nothing. I pay my mortgage off, you know. <laughs> and I pay my car notes on time. I paid all my bills. And I bought my kids food and clothing. And I, I, I should go to heaven. <laughs> Your contribution was too small. Minsky. Cheap. Stingy. If all you can give is money, you're stingy. Right? So I want you to really understand this so you forgive my emphasizing this. But I know how our minds is and this we, this mind of ours has to be hammered over again and again and again because we don't understand this thing. So good intentions are always on the useful side of life. Real intentions are always on the meaningful side of life. But I've given you a schematic and a guide to follow. And as you do that, you yourself will take away this sense of meaninglessness from your life. And that's a great thing, isn't it? You've been trying to deal with your sense of meaninglessness by overindulging in entertainment. Hmm? You've been running hither and thither, involving yourself in this and that, trying to make your life meaningful. Right? Marching up and down the street, you know what I mean? Involving yourself in inflammatory rhetoric. Right? But still, your life don't feel meaningful. Right? You've been trying to stuff that void of meaninglessness with husband. Let me put me a husband in my void of meaninglessness. But you made no contribution to your husband. Therefore, the husband does you no good. You get no relief from your deep sense of meaninglessness. Well, the husband didn't do Let me stuff me some kids into here. And you stuff some kids here. But you're making no contribution to the kids. Hence, the meaninglessness. Let me stuff a PhD in there. Okay, you stuff the PhD in, but you share no knowledge. Meaningless. Meaningless. It's still there. And so it goes on and on and on. We have to make contributions. There is no other way. And as you make that, suddenly you become a blessing. You see, 
suddenly, when you pass, flowers will not bloom the same as they did before. You will become a Buddha. You will become a Jesus. And remember, Jesus said, unto uh, uh, all men, everybody has been given the opportunity to be sons of God, the daughters of God. It's nothing new. And it all begins with us learning these fundamental things, this fundamental sadhana, this fundamental hard work. You see, the greatest antidote to your anger at others, at others' anger at you, your anger at yourself, anger at the absent other, and abstract anger is to love. There is no better antidote. If you really want to give yourself some relief from your anger at other people, love. The anger will disappear. Get into a relationship with love. Okay? It's like handling an enemy, right? How do you best handle an enemy? You're making your friend. I think that's what Lieutenant illustrated for us in an example. Now, he could have handled that fellow officer totally wrong. He handled him totally right and made the man his friend. The man wants him as his friend now. Success! And if he keeps doing it, this man will die for him. There will come a time, there is a bond, you understand, between officers, officers know this, that is unparalleled in all other relationships. It may sound strange to you. Officers are closer than husband and wife. Because you ain't going to die for your husband, and, and most husbands surely are not going <laughs> to die for you. But your partner will die. What happens, the bullet that hits you, hits, hits your partner, hits you. There's a bond because their relationship is at, the, at a real deep they are dying. That's the greatest contribution. You trade your life. You will cease to exist for It's too deep. And when that arises, hmm, have no man greater love for his brother than what? The ability to lay down their life. Christ said, I die for you because I love you. Hmm? Powerful, powerful stuff. And many officers, if they do the thing right, you know what I mean? Because it's a natural thing. But they know what, and I like talking to police because they understand what I'm talking about. They don't have all of the theoretical knowledge and all of the sophisticated terminology, but they have the experience. They know what it feels like to be willing to die for somebody. They know what real love is. Like. And it frustrates the hell out of them when they come home to a wife and they got to get into this little tiny relationship with them that is based on business. When you do this for me, you know, they can handle that. And many officers, not knowing what's going on, blow their brains out. They have twice the level of suicide. Because they, they see themselves, I'm doing all this good. I have, I'm, I'm this tremendous person, and nobody appreciates me. And the ultimate act of revenge, I'll deprive society of my person. By all. So it gets very deep. And so we're uh, way over time, <laughs> all right? But I wanted to spend whatever time necessary today, because sometimes we won't be traveling this road no more, because we have so many other places to go. But I want to make sure you all understand this thing. Yes, sir? I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. You said the best way to handle your enemies is to make them your friend. I found that the foundation of most of my relationships with my friend was trust. And yeah. it would just be so difficult for me to trust someone I consider an enemy. Very good. I didn't say it would be easy. That's why I said this is work for those who wish to become Buddhas. You know, because you have to transcend so much that is pity in yourself. You have to you have to drop so much of your own ego to get into these higher states. You will notice that the more ego you have, the harder it is to make contributions at higher level. People that got a lot of you can't even make contributions yeah. at this level. Yeah. I mean, yeah. let's think about it. Uh -huh. But the, the, the more you're able to manage your ego, mm -hmm. right, then you can make contributions at deeper and deeper and deeper levels. You see? And uh, so you're I can understand the initial difficulty, but that's only because ego is there. That means we have to take our ego down. So. Well, then you're afraid of being a fool. Too, of course, but who's afraid of being a fool? <laughs> you. You put yourself out there like that. It's that ego. Yeah. 
You want to maintain the part of your ego mythology that said that you are so sophisticated enough, you can't be no fool. Not me. Right? I'm too, you know, uh, conscious to be a fool. And so you hang on to that mythology. But in some relationships, you see, you have to be a fool. And what's wrong with being a fool? There's situations in life where you must be a fool. And you must know what they are. You should have the freedom to be a fool and to be a wise fool. A wise one. Why not? There are many situations in life where you need to be a fool. In love, you need to be a fool. Only fools fall in love. Please make a note. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions now? Why is it that people who have big egos seem to always want to impart knowledge? Well, it's a give them a sense. <laughs> you have to be <laughs> the right person. <laughs> Knowledge, I mean, remember I'm talking about at these levels of, of sharing. One of the things that you will find out if you are able to get to a level. Now, people that, as you could say, have big egos that want to give knowledge. First thing you have to see, do they even have any knowledge? There are such things as big egos <laughs> without knowledge, right? Obviously. So most of the big egos that are given knowledge, if you look closely, they don't really have any knowledge. So we're not even going to deal with them, right? The other form of the big ego, with knowledge. Why do they do it? Because the pleasure of, that it comes from giving knowledge is immense. It makes the sex act look. These are people that rather give knowledge than the screw. Do you understand me? Mm -hmm. Now this is deep. Because you can never fathom that. Ain't no way in the world you would rather spend an evening with a woman, giving her knowledge. You want to spend an evening with a woman in the hotel. Or she want to spend an evening with you in the motel. That's where you were at. No knowledge. But a person that, even if they have this out of blown ego, but the sheer pleasure that is derived from the act of contributing knowledge is immense. I'm glad you raised that point, Sandy, because I want to point out the fact that as you are able to rise in the hierarchy of contribution, the degree of pleasure. I already pointed out how there's an impoverishment that takes place based on the, the lower levels. Mm -hmm. Similarly, as you move up in the hierarchy, the, the degree of pleasure and satisfaction increases. Now, if you give your kids some money and you give your wife some money, you're grumbling, man, damn, man, again, damn, ain't no joy in it, right? If it goes over a certain amount, hey, <laughs> you know, it's actually painful now. Yeah. You know, there's a certain amount of money that you can give another person that'll cause you to have a heart attack, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it hurts you. So you only can, it cuts off. But as you can, but as you go deeper to giving a praise, the pleasure that comes from that is so much superior to the pleasure that comes from giving money and so forth. And at this level of knowledge, then, ah, the pleasure is so immense that they can't step themselves. They really can't. They can't manage it. The giving of knowledge. It takes a while to learn how to manage it. You know, you notice yourself, whenever you come into some knowledge, there's automatically something in you to make you want to run and tell everybody. And it's not always ego. You see, sometimes it is, but not always. Sometimes it you just can't contain it. It bursts out of you. What can you do? You have to share. And, you, you, and, and, and the hardest thing is to shut your mouth. And it takes a long time to get enough discipline to be quiet. Maradi reduced the whole path to something very simple. Eat less, sleep less, talk less, and sex less. You got the path, the great path. And the hard part is talking less. Because how do you keep quiet when all that stuff is there? It's too much. It's just too much. And it takes a great sadhana, a great discipline. That is a small answer to your question. It's much deeper, but it's a beginning. And I know that you have enough of this here to find the rest yeah. of this in Jesus, okay? All right. Anything else? Because we won't come down this road again. When you say, uh, you know, like how you handle anger, what about if you didn't handle it in a good way, but mm -hmm. later on, you, you know, you, you sit down, you analyze it, and write about it. Mm -hmm. if you, I mean, that's not the kind of example you want, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good too. That's homework, okay. right? Because what you're doing is that you are critiquing yourself. Mm-hmm. You're saying, oh, I could have did this better. You know, maybe I should have did that. You see, mm-hmm. I'll get it better next time. You stand on the on the on the path. Your aim and the and objective is to get this thing better and better. That's a homework. Okay. That's a homework. Well, even when you realize your mistake, that's a homework. Even if you screwed it up, but you are aware and conscious right. of that, that's a good homework. I yeah, so, so, right. so you've yeah. been doing homework? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You, know, you, know. you know. I thought it had to be a success. No, that is a success. I, I had one. Of them. You had one of them too? <laughs> yeah. That's a homework, and it counts because it, the self awareness is there. Right, okay. Right. Before, you would have never even looked at it. Mm-hmm. You see? Before, you would have never even looked at it. Just the mere fact that you're becoming conscious of your failure is tremendous. I'm aware That's of situations true. where yeah. I was angry and then I, it, before I wouldn't have even recognized Didn't even recognize it was it. anger. Look mm-hmm. at that. See, that's good homework. Yeah. That in itself. Yeah. If you've had an experience, Sandra, where for the first time you've been able to let your anger come up out of that repressed state, your self-awareness is such that mm-hmm. you can penetrate down into the, the mm-hmm. pockets and mm-hmm. corners of your psyche and find for the first time, my God. Yes. Now you're in a position to deal with it. Right? The cancer has been discovered. It can be treated now. We can handle that. Whereas before, it might have been so little awareness that it was there all the time. And you all around thinking that la di di la di da, I have no anger, and this stuff is killing me. Yeah. And you don't know what, what, what's going on. Yeah. Right? So that is a tremendous homework. That's a tremendous realization to come to. A breakthrough, if you will. Crossing a threshold. That's tremendous. Right? It's a tremendous thing. So no, those those all count. Any effort at spiritual, psychological, and emotional growth counts. Even your failures on this path count. Please make a point. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think. <laughs> go ahead. Run one last question. If we count uh, these instances, do we go down this list that you can Yeah, try to fill. Yeah, okay. those are some things. There's more, but as you go through this stuff, process. Because the most important thing is to process. Because by processing your homework, you bring it up into awareness and you start getting a real, real good feel for it. So it's important that you do the homework and equally important that you process, you see? Because you got to check for those feelings. Like she, she did a good homework on that book, but she didn't identify her feelings. She didn't know how much she got up. She knows she was feeling good, but I want you to really have a full awareness of how good. Because that motivates you to do it right That do it again, though. When you know that, my God, you might go out and say, well, can you make me angry? Please, can you do something to make me angry so I can manage my anger and get this feeling again? Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> All right, I think we've gone over. Homework? Homework? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we won't have, way, okay. we won't have a, uh, a session next week. Oh, uh, but do the homework that you didn't no do session this session week. How about no, that? Just that time homework? No, sir. Just that time homework. Okay. <laughs>